associate member of the Center for Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning at also at ISI, and also an associate member of the Technology Innovation Hub at Indian Statistical Institute. He is a certified design thinker from MIT Sloan School of Management and holds a doctorate in computer science from Indian Statistical Institute. He has long years of teaching and research experience and very prestigiously is currently serving in the Lancet, which you know is the major most important journal in the field of medicine about the COVID-19 Commission India Task Force, which is a very important activity we know for all of us to get out of this. His current interest encompass crowdsourcing, big data analysis, computational biology. He received the Impact Scholars Award from Google, Young Engineer Award from INE, Young Engineer Award from Institution of Engineers, Bard Award and BioClues organization, which is again very prestigious, Young Scientist Award from Indian Science Congress, and won several best paper awards. He is an INE Young Associate and Sir Bisseswaraya Young Faculty Research Fellow. He and overall uh, it is beyond this, he is an excellent researcher with a very nice uh, set of contributions to the field of computational biology. I am sure all of you will love this talk. Uh, welcome, Professor Vattacharya. The stage is all yours. Uh, Professor Vattachari, you have to unmute yourself, please. You have to unmute. Yeah, Thank am you. I audible? Thank you. We, 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 we can hear you now. Yeah, can you see my screen? Yeah, we can now see your screen. Thank you. Great. Um, so yeah, I was basically telling that Pobitra uh, basically requested me to send a uh, brief bio quickly, and I basically copy and pasted it from my website. So I, I made a request to read a subset of that, but he read the entire thing. You know, I mean, no, it's still a subset. It is a still <laughs> yeah. subset. Okay, whatever. Um, so, so we, we we have already listened to many things about this high performance computing, and you have got some sort of introduction about this high performance computing. Got some sort of idea how these things are getting uh, application areas. So. I am no more focusing into only that high performance computing highlighting a single application area. Rather, I am taking you to a bigger, bigger universe and I'm showing multiple possible applications where I'm basically taking this computing and the artificial intelligence to be precise prediction things together for showing some sort of applications in computational biology. And the, and the area that I'm going to have a focus here for today's talk is actually microbiome analysis at scale. So I'm going to dive into a little bit of biology here because you know until and unless you understand the background, you will not be appreciating what I'm actually doing. And uh, I'm going to give you a highlight what kind of data are actually becoming available from this kind of biological domain. And then have a very precise focus because I know it's a, it's a uh, hardly one hour talk. So, so better not to roam around into multiple works. Rather, rather I'm focusing into only a single contribution that we have recently made uh, and then focus into that and then showing how, how the high performance computing things and maybe the prediction results can actually be helpful uh, for, for, the, for the benefit of mankind. So talking about this microbiome term that I have already introduced in the title, um, you have been introduced with the whole cell. You know that what is happening within the cell. So that is corresponding to a species. You are looking at a species, you are you are zooming into the cell and you are basically trying to see what is happening within the cell. If you zoom out now, you might be wondering what is happening between the cells because I heard that someone was asking this question, what happens as a communication between the cells? I want to take you zoom out further. Look at the entire species as a whole, not just within the cell. And then you are given with a lot of information about the species. You know, genomics is there, proteomics is there, transcriptomics is there. And, and if you look at the other, other different kind of activities that are happening dynamically, like the epigenetic information, you know that if you have the DNA sequence, the protein sequence, you know the details about the genes and the proteins, you are actually talking about some sort of static data. But then there are many things which are still not clear because people see that although two different people have similar kind of genetic patterns, in some portion they are showing some sort of different activities or maybe in some different tissue types they're showing different kind of behaviors. 
that might be a reason due to the dynamic activity which is happening, which is actually attributed to the epigenetics. We know that in many cases we have this methylation happening in some of the portions of the genes, or maybe in the promoter region of the genes. So although the genetic patterns are same due to this kind of dynamic methylation happening, it might happen that people are showing different kind of behaviors, or maybe in different tissues we are having different kind of activities. But then even after we have this information about the epigenetics, and many others that is happening within the body statically and dynamically people are still perplexed why there is a difference between people in response to different kind of drugs in response to different kind of uh, environmental effects or maybe even though they are having similar kind of genes similar kind of dynamic methylated patterns in the promoter of the genes but still something is happening so what is there what we are actually missing when people try to look at it that do not look at it as a single species. Is there something happening around the species? People try to figure out what is there around the species. And then they figure out we have this entire collection of ecological communities, which are nothing but the microorganisms. So there can be different kind of microorganisms. But in general, we basically tell that there are three broad kinds of microorganisms. They can be common cell, they can be symbiotic, they can be pathogenic. Obviously, you know these microorganisms could be like virus and virus and bacteria and fungi, but then they are broadly categorized into these three types that will basically reside at a particular site. That means if you look at your skin and if you just try to imagine what are the different microorganisms that are staying with you on your skin. If you look at the blood, maybe there are some sort of healthy microbiome. Although, although there is a debate whether there is really any microorganism existing there if you have a healthy body, but then if you have some sort of infection, you might have microorganisms getting into your blood. You can have something there in your brain. You can have something there in your gut. Gut microbiome is actually known to everyone. We know that there are many things about the gut microbiome, the, the healthiness of these microorganisms that are actually controlling what is happening within our body. That means we are not we as a species, as a single body, we are with all the microorganisms that we carry with us. And if you look at the first category, the common cell microorganisms, these are nothing but the organisms that will stay with you and it will take some sort of food supply from you. But they are not actually making any kind of major contribution into your body. So, so they, are, they are not interacting, they are not making any major association with your body. They are just dependent on your body for taking foods. But on the other side, you can have some other kind of microorganisms which are actually symbiotic, that are having a symbiosis with your entire body, that are actually making their lives beneficial in association with the host. That means their existence in our body is actually helping us. For example, you can, you can pick up this particular example of this uh, bacteroids that are basically responsible uh, for doing something internally in our body within our human intestine. So they might be helping us in the in the digestion of something. And, and many, many other microorganisms have their different purposes. So they are basically helping us staying in our body. So the first category was there, which is there in our body, but not doing anything major. Or you might think about it, we are still unknown what they're doing. That is why we just know that they're dependent on us to take the food supply. That is why they are common cell. But for symbiotic, we know that there is a defined association. Looking at the third category, which is your... Could you please mute yourself? Yeah. So looking at the pathogenic category, it's something like the set of organisms that will actually invade into your body, that will be causing some sort of problem in the, in the, in the host, like the SARS-CoV-2, which you know uh, as the most popular virus causing this. COVID-19 that are actually invading our social life, economic life and everything for the last two years or so. So, so looking at these three different categories, you now know that there are huge set of other kind of small organisms that are residing in a body and then they are doing something. They can be doing something good for us, they can be doing something bad for us, or they might be just dependent on us for taking the food. We are still not aware what they're doing in its entirety. It might happen that some of the common cell, uh, common cell microorganisms is becoming symbiotic just because we become aware that what they're doing. Now looking at this entire microbiome that might be residing with us and then trying to understand what might be their activities, you will now know that 
just because they are also independent species they have this entire thing that is happening within our body may not be at this complex scale because you understood that just because human beings are too complex we have a lot of things happening within us if you look at the uh, look at the uh, species that are lower down in the hierarchy obviously it might happen that they are not having so much complex activities but obviously they should have proteins because they should be doing something internally they should have lipids they should have polysaccharides they should have nucleic acids there can be viruses that are rna viruses there can be uh, the fungi protists algae everything and there might be metabolites that are getting generated within them and they are doing something internally so obviously there is a defined pathway that are able to characterize what is happening within each of these species and we have this whole bunch of species with us and that is actually defining your microbiome now you might wonder what is then the actual dimension of this microbiome how many such organisms are actually there as a part of our body then we have to really understand what is the human microbiome so we basically define this human microbiome as the collection of all the microorganisms that will basically reside on or within why well, explicitly using these two terms separately because we have this on defining the skin microbiome or maybe within defining the microbiome that is residing within our body it could be the gut microbiome it could be the microbiome residing in the unhealthy blood or maybe in the brain so these things so that is why i'm also mentioning they could be in the tissues in the biofluids corresponding to anatomical sites so if we can figure out okay this is the anatomical site be it a skin be it the blood be it the brain or maybe the gut we are able to define that okay this is the collection of microorganisms staying there so the human microbiome is nothing but the collection of all these microbiomes that are residing into the individual anatomical site so we have a skin microbiome we have a gut microbiome we we may have Uh, under debate the blood microbiome we may have the brain microbiome and in this way if you think about all possible microbiomes taken together that is defining our entire microbiome and you know 90% of all these microbiomes are actually attributed to some of the diseases that we know or maybe helping us to fight with the diseases it might not always be pathogenic it might also be symbiotic that i have already mentioned and just think what is their actual number you know if you just take a summation of all the genes that we have in our human body there are actually 100 is to 1 which is the ratio defining the number of genes in in accumulation of all the genes that, that are present within this entire human microbiome with respect to the genes that are that having within our body so that means the genes that we have we have 100 times more genes within the individual species that we have around us and the actual number of symbiotic microbial cells is estimated around 100 to at 10 to 100 trillion currently we know that there are about 40 trillion cells but it is estimated that it could reach up to 100 trillion cells and that is around us or maybe within us residing at a particular anatomical site so this is nothing but a domain that basically requires high performance computing may not necessarily be the way we define high performance computing with the help of distributed computing or parallel computing but if possible some sort of computing that is smart enough and sophisticated enough so that we can get the result very quickly if we are not able to dependent on any parallel computation or distributed computing what if we think about some sort of approximation approaches so that we can quickly get the result maybe with some sort of noise or maybe error but then we need it very fast we need it with very very sophisticated form of visualization so that this entire big thing can be visualized within a very nutshell maybe we need some sort of dimensionality reduction to be smart we need some sort of uh, prediction analysis to be smart we need some sort of indexing to keep the data in a smart way so everything we need to do with this kind of data is actually requiring some sort of smart computing which is high performance computing in 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 some way and then you know that there are more than 10000 microbes species that are actually residing within us or maybe around us so remember that it's not just the species that are jumping onto our body and residing for a week it's something like we are actually holding this entire microbiome with us there might be interchange of microbes microorganisms maybe something is going out of our body and then something new is coming but we have this whole bunch of at least more than 10000 species that is always with us around us or maybe within us and that is your entire human microbiome so talking about the global scale data analysis that is really happening around the world we now have this 
defined project, which is known as Integrative Human Microbiome Project, which was actually having an initial version, which was defined as Human Microbiome Project. So this Human Microbiome Project is now defined as HMP1 that you can see on the left upper corner of this particular figure, where the main target of Human Microbiome Project Phase 1 was just to focus on the different anatomical size, be it a nasal cavity, be it the oral cavity, be it the gut, be it the skin, and then try to identify what are the different microorganisms that we have. It's like defining what is the skin microbiome, nasal microbiome, oral microbiome, and so on. And then have some sort of demonstration projects uh, to take part globally and then come together to find out what, is the what, what are the community composition, what are the microbial pathways, what are the sequences of these different microorganisms, and so on. And then we have an extension of this first phase into HMP2. And then these two, HMP1 and HMP2, is now getting defined as Integrative Human Microbiome Project. And they have a publication in Nature in the year 2019. Uh, this is not my publication, obviously. Uh, this is done at a global scale where people are actually doing biological experiments. This is not about doing some sort of computational skills. Whether they are mostly biologists, obviously there are bioinformaticians to help them uh, to, to do some sort of experimentation with which they will be able to characterize the microorganisms, they will be able to sequence the microorganisms and they have the full details of them. So what they're doing in the phase two is something like they're, they're considering on the preterm level birth of the babies and then they are figuring out with a longitudinal study what are the microorganisms that are uh, that are getting generated around the, the baby it's like at the very first phase when the species when the baby is not yet out of the womb they are basically starting the project and they are trying to figure out as soon as it come out as soon as the environment gets gets some sort of association with the body, how, how they basically adopt the different kind of microbiomes around us and maybe pre-diabetic activity of this microbiome and, and so on. And they're doing the similar kind of thing like the HMP1, finding out what are the community composition, finding out the pathways, uh, profiling the virome, and then finding out the antibody profiles. So we have oh, these entire that's bunch that's of data with us. I request everyone to mute themselves so that it becomes easier for us to communicate. Yeah, so this this could be a big amount of data for doing something serious at scale because you know that there are people, there are different anatomical sites and for each of the anatomical sites we have this lot of data. So this was just to give you a flavor how, how a microbiome data might look like but today I'm going to focus on a different kind of microbiome data Although this is focused into a particular site, the way I was telling, it could be skin microbiome, it could be nasal microbiome focusing on maybe the skin or maybe the nasal cavity. But then here, I'm more interested to talk about one of our works, not, not the work that done by other people, rather our work where we're focusing on microbiome of the built environment. So the actual definition behind this built environment is something like an environment which is actually constructed by human beings. So you know that we are not only defined by the structure of us, rather we have the other structures, the artificial structures that are made by us. What if we look into the microorganisms that are actually residing there? And what we started working on at a global scale, obviously this project cannot be done by a single researcher or maybe a single university with a bunch of researchers. This is, this is an attempt where we have basically focused at a very large scale to look into what are the microbiome that resides in mass transit systems? It is like going into the going into the metro stations of a particular city and then seeing in that particular metro station, what are the microbiome? You understand now what is the meaning of microbiome, the different kind of microorganisms that might reside at a particular site. And we define this site to be, let's say, the different materials. What are the microbiome residing in the metal? What are the microbiome? residing on let's say plastic material or maybe wooden material and all these materials should be in a mass transit system and the goal behind this is to understand that just because the human beings will actually interact with the environment they might take a lot of microorganisms from the environment and you know that the mass transit systems are the are the actual built in and built environment where you interact frequently so you use the metro station you 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 commute through the stations 
and it might happen that you are touching a handrail you are you are touching the ticket vending machine you are sitting in a particular chair which is made of window and there are a lot of microorganisms that are basically taken by your body and you know that there are enormous number of people who are commuting through this mass transit systems so you, you see if you think about just this sars cov2 and if you think about the sars cov2 transmitting between people with the help of this kind of you know mass transit systems it becomes a dangerous activity to happen there so we should be restricting this kind of things but we are not yet talking about this sars cov2 rather we are more focused into the symbiotic microorganisms that will actually reside into your body and then do some doing doing will be doing some sort of important things with us i mean they will be helping us to do something so we basically we we this project has basically started in the year 2016 and uh, the data that has been gathered during 2016 to 2018 so years of data has actually been published in this journal cell uh, in this year only 2021 i am going to present some of the analysis that has been done as a part of this publication but then remember that this data is continuously being collected so we have the data for 2019 20 21 and the data is being gathered in the next few years also so hopefully within a decade we will have a longitudinal uh, longitudinal profile of what are the different microorganisms there and how they are changing over time but then for the time being we are focused into a data of 3 years where we have collected the microorganisms that are residing in different materials around 60 cities so we have focused into the collection of data from 60 cities uh, there are 4728 samples collected and you know for each of the sample collected so this sample is coming from a particular location and we are collecting the sample from a particular material so let's say a uh, wooden material i am collecting the sample from the wooden material so there can be enormous number of microorganism residing into that wooden material so each sample is actually containing an entire entire set of microorganisms it's an ecological collection of communities so a lot of lot of viruses bacteria fungi and and many things could be there and therefore we have roughly 8 trillion bases to study so we figured out that there are 31 core taxa after after doing the taxonomic analysis we found there are drug resistance you know this is interesting to know that if we can figure out that these microorganisms are actually holding antimicrobial resistance genes we can actually understand that we might be losing our 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 uh, you know resistance to the drugs in near future if if we have this kind of genes spreading around us with the help of this kind of microorganisms this might happen that many of the drugs that are still functional might not be functional in near future just because of the existence of this kind of anti drug resistance so that that is really interesting to study whether this is there as a part of these microorganisms and we figure out that there are roughly 748 unique bacteria 10928 viruses that are actually new so we have been able to figure out a lot of new species in the 60 cities you know one of these species could be something that might be creating a pandemic in near future because you know that only a single virus has created a massacre around the world so this might happen for the other species that are still discovered so obviously it is really important to understand what is happening around us just to give you a flavor about the data this is the website if you are interested you can look at this website you will get the enter access to the data that is available as a part of this project which is known as metasub so this metasub is actually a consortium and this cell paper has actually a number of authors has around 500 so a lot of research is actually involved in that process and then let me jump into now into the more interesting part of computing not just focus into biology so that we can at least give you a flavor that how the sophisticated computation or maybe the efficient computation can actually be done to deal with this kind of data uh, to to be done at scale obviously but then looking at this let me figure out on maybe three or four major steps because you know for having this kind of large scale publication we have been able to do a lot of analysis it's not possible to talk about everything here within this short period but let me give you a flavor with three major things and then an extended analysis these three major things are nothing but the taxonomy analysis and then i'm going to jump into the dimensionality reduction analysis and then some sort of artificial intelligence stuffs to be precise machine learning stuffs so we are going to predict that uh, given a sample is it possible to tell from which city this sample has come from 
So let me give you a flavor with all these three things, and then I'm going to talk about some extended results related to the antimicrobial resistance so that I can highlight that if this can actually help us in understanding what is happening around us related to the drug resistance. Uh, are, we, are we really in a vulnerable, vulnerable situation where we might be losing uh, resist, I mean, we might be inviting problems related to resistance of drugs. Okay, so for doing this kind of taxonomic profiling, uh, we have to use some sort of sophisticated approach and this should be more recent ones. So I'm introducing an approach which is Kraken Unique, which was formerly defined as Kraken HLL. This HLL is actually a hyper log log based approach. This is a kind of novel metagenomics classifier. So the goal is pretty simple. We have around 5000 samples. For each sample, I know that there are a lot of microorganisms hiding in the sample. And I have to figure out what are the microorganisms there. This is the major purpose of this entire analysis. We have to find out given this sample, within this sample, how many viruses are there, how many bacteria are there, how many fungi are there and what are those? To what exact taxa that belongs to? Is it something like Streptococcus? Is it something like you know SARS-CoV-2? Is it something like uh, or, or anything else? Maybe acne. So to be more precise on this matter, this SARS-CoV-2 is actually RNA virus, and this analysis was done at a DNA level. So obviously we're not able to track something like SARS-CoV-2, but this this analysis is currently being extended so that we have some sort of profiling related to SARS-CoV-2, and we can actually monitor in what way SARS-CoV-2 might be, might be uh, propagating from one city to the other. But this is not a part of today's discussion. So what you should understand that if you are given with this entire DNA sequences that are coming from this individual microorganisms, because you know, given this sample, we have been able to figure out what are the different, uh, different species there, and then we have been able to sequence them. Now, after getting the sequence, the major task is to identify to which particular species or maybe to which taxa this sequence belong to. Now, this is a challenging problem because if you feel like we have a single samples in which there might be, let's say, thousands of different species, we have thousands of sequences with us and we have a lot of reads. I have already highlighted there are uh, a few trillion bases that we have with us. So one possible approach to understand better about this computing is like without just focusing into the entire read, what if we take a frequency of the individual k -mars? So we know that the, the occurrence of individual nucleotides within a DNA or maybe the occurrence of individual uh, amino acids within the protein sequences have some sort of significance. So they are like the unique signatures. If you think about a DNA sequence, you might have the four characters ATCG. So a biology, when a biologist say we have a DNA sequence, a computer scientist understand that we have a long string and this has an alphabet of ATCG. So looking at this particular string, you should understand that if you're talking about a particular species, we have a string of a particular length. For example, a human DNA is defined with a long string of 3 billion characters. So we have this entire string of 3 billion characters. So just by looking at this 3 billion characters, it's really hard to tell from where they might have come from. And it might take a lot of time to, to you know, align this particular entire sequence with the species that are available with you. What people do is like, they can find out some sort of k -mars and the frequencies of the K-Mars. When I say K-Mar, given the K, it is nothing but successive K nucleotides that you have. So it's like if you define it as a 3-Mar, you can have ATC as one of the 3-Mars. What if we find out the frequencies of all these K-Mars and the frequencies are actually matched with the frequencies of the K-Mars in different taxon. So look at this. This is not a very exact approach, but this is a very fast approach just because we are breaking it into pieces and looking at the frequencies. And we believe that the frequencies of the KMARS will be some sort of signature to identify very quickly to what taxa they might be matching. And then with some sort of data sketching approach that is shown in step B, uh, with Kraken Unique, one can actually identify that what is the frequency of different KMARS, and then we can find out what is the contribution of different tax and to that? And we can have a list something like this that is shown in uh, step C, where you can see that we can get some sort of read, let's say 122 reads. And out of these 122 reads, unique KMRs are 112. And the coverage of this KMR is 0.0004 with respect to the species that is given here. And just because 
this particular species has a very less coverage for this particular count of the k mars we can tell that it's a bad classification on the other side if we get a species for which we know that there is a good coverage we can actually claim that this is a very good classification you see without even doing some sort of real machine learning rather focusing into this bunch of k mars representing the different species in different samples we can actually find out the signature match with the taxa and then based on that we can do some sort of estimated classification to know to what particular uh, particular uh, uh, taxonomic profile this this can actually be attributed to so this is actually an algorithm that was published in 2018 in genome biology not not our paper but we have been able to use it that has been extended from this kraken hll because this hyper log log approach has been adopted in kraken unique with a slight modification but you know that the big deal is looking at the lamp ram kraken unique basically requires a huge amount of primary memory and that is ideally 128 to 512 gb that is too much for 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 the general infrastructures that we have in any any standard uh, educational institute in india might be available in some sort of uh, top tier institute but may not be available in general sense so for them if you are really interested to look this kind of analysis and do something at your own i would suggest that you take uh, a tool like central fuge where you can ideally require let's say 4 to 12 gb which can actually be accommodated with a simple computer and then you can do this kind of stuff at your own obviously you are not going to get a very good accuracy like this for example kraken unique gives a very good recall and precision you might miss that with centrifuge but then you can get something at least and then as soon as we can find out what is the taxonomic profile we can actually build up a tree something like this and this is another beauty of analysis doing analysis on microbiomes at scale you need some sort of good visualization approach if the data is actually huge enough then you have to think or think some sort of efficient approach with which you can actually visualize what is happening inside and we can actually look at this kind of taxonomic tree which can basically tell me what is the connection between the different species that has been observed in this entire analysis and you see i have demarcated the outer layer with either gray or white where you can understand that this novel species are actually shown with this gray color so we have a lot of species that are actually highlighted with this gray i have already mentioned that we have been able to find out a lot of new bacteria and other species and viruses obviously the next one that i want to include here uh, an interesting study like dimensionality reduction you know that if you are given with this kind of big data where the dimension is huge you know that uh, a particular sample is actually getting defined by all the microorganisms that are actually holding you see what i am telling now that a sample is nothing but an object and i want to understand this individual objects let's say i have this 4720 samples so i have let's say a, a staff a machine learning data where i have 4728 objects i want to classify them i want to classify them based on the cities i know there are 60 cities i want to classify them based on the weather i want to classify them based on based on the material from which they have been collected is it really possible to tell <coughs> whether there is a unique signature between the cities between the materials between the weather and so on because you know every city is characterized or maybe every site is characterized by a particular temperature is a particular weather and a particular material from which the data is getting collected if you think about the uh, the the, uh, the common dimensional reduction techniques you know that pca ts any these are there but then i would suggest that you have to use something like you map if you are really doing something in computational biology and need dimensionality reduction it is it is it is always suggested in many cases where you really interested to look at the global structure of the data and you need to visualize it in a better way you should be depending upon you map i have put a comparative uh, analysis of all the features of you map tsn and pcn you can actually see that the major advantage with you map is that the visualization is better it is relatively faster and then it can actually produce some sort of global structure of the data and just because it can capture the global structure it becomes comparatively uh, i mean it it can be better than tsne where tsne has a focus of looking into the local structure so if we apply you map you have to understand how this basically works you know that it's a kind of approach in which we basically uh, depend on the manifold theory 
we have a couple of assumptions in this algorithm like the data is uniformly distributed on uh, Rainmanian manifold. The Rainmanian metric is locally constant and the manifold is locally connected. And we have a couple of uh, interesting uh, assumptions here like this will actually assume that there is a fuzzy topological structure within the data. But in the advantage that we get is that with this embedding, just because we are considering as a fuzzy topological structure, we have some sort of flexibility. And that is why we can have some sort of visualization, something like this with the help of UMAP. So every dot in this UMAP plot is basically highlighting it's a sample. And the color is actually getting used to represent from which city or maybe which which uh, I'm becoming more, more, uh, more, more broader in this sense. We have been able to create a UMAP plot for the cities, for the for the for the materials, for the weather. But this one is more interesting where we can actually look at this UMAP analysis with respect to the different regions around the world. You see the North America that the samples that are actually in red are somehow somehow together. Similarly, the, the, the ones that are in blue that are somehow closer together. So based on what kind of features we are actually looking at, this is nothing but the microorganisms that it has. That means the samples that are collected from North America has a kind of microorganisms that is unique and distinguishable from the microorganisms that are obtained from the cities in East Asia and so on. So you see every region has actually some sort of metagenomic profile and that profile is unique and what we basically use this term as fingerprinting. We can have this concept defined as metagenomic fingerprinting. Every city or maybe every region or maybe every material has their own signature of the metagenomic profile. And we have been able to show that with a good indexing, you know, if you want to store the data and if you want to do this kind of KMR based analysis and find out the frequencies of KMRs and want to connect one, one uh, sample with the other, you have to have some sort of efficient data indexing. Uh, we have been able, I mean, we are basically using this kind of graph based indexing. The scheme is known as GeoDNA, where every sample is given with you. You know the details, the, the metadata related to the city samples and every sample is actually contributing to this computation of KMRs. And what we can do, we can actually have this kind of graph based multi sample sequence index where if you start reading from one path and go to the other path and then come back to the same path again, you can actually read it through this different kind of paths. It's not exactly the same, but it's something like a try that you can imagine. You can have a try data structure where we can have multiple such uh, streams uh, to be to be put together. So it's not exactly the same, but a similar kind of concept. But with this kind of only a single graph like indexing, we can have a lot of such sequences connected together so that we can actually browse them and distinguish them. And if we have a long path, where multiple colors are getting shared, we can actually tell that they have a lot of components that are actually common between them. So that is why if we have this kind of microbial signatures, if we have now the prediction of different features based on these signatures, we have been able to see that looking at the X axis, if these are the cities and looking at the Y axis, if these are the different features, like we can have the population, we have the surface, we have the elevation, we have the coastal region or not, we have the population density and many other things that can be actually uniquely characterized with some sort of good accuracy. You see, it's not like everything can be predicted well, but then there are many things that can be predicted with a high accuracy. You see that a lower accuracy is shown in blue and a higher accuracy is shown in red. So you know there are some of the cities that are actually showing unique signatures and again the other features related to the cities like the population, the elevation, uh, the density, the region, or maybe the weather, temperature, climate, many of these things can actually be predicted from the features. And based on this, we basically claim that, you know, with a very good accuracy, we can actually tell from what city this has come from. This might not be true essentially for all the materials, all the climate-based features, we are getting accuracy which is 
not reasonably very high, but then only for the cities we have made an observation that is something like we claim informally. You give me your shoe, and we can tell me we can tell you from where city you have come from. So the concept is something like you will be giving me your shoe, and I can make an assumption that okay, just because you came from a city, you should have all the microorganisms that is there under your shoe. I can actually take a sample from your shoe, and I can get all the microorganisms that are there residing under your shoe. And by looking at the signature, I can actually predict from which city you might have come from. And we have been able to get a good accuracy, which is which is close to 88% with a simple random forest model. Just because we were dependent on the signatures, we didn't take the entire sequence and try to classify them. That could have been dissolved the target. But then looking at the signatures that are held by internal structures of the DNA, that is good enough to tell whether this is coming from this city or that city. That city. Finally, I told you that I'm going to show some sort of extended analysis. It's not just related to the sequences and the different microorganisms as a part of the microbiome. Rather, it is really interesting to look at if we now have what are the microorganisms that we have in our hand with respect to each city? Is it really possible to look at now into these microorganisms and then take the sequences align with the antimicrobial resistance genes that we already know. You know, there are a lot of genes that are AMR genes. If we use this a tool like uh, MEGARES and do this kind of ontology analysis, we can actually tell that whether they are antibiotic resistance genes or not. And we found out that there is a good co-occurrence of AMR genes. You can see this kind of uh, this is this is a it map where we can actually see that these are clustered regions where there are a, bunch of such species that basically share AMR genes with each other. And this is actually the profiling of the AMR genes, the, actually the, the number of AMR genes that are detected and the distribution among the different samples in each city. You see, every city has their own unique signature of AMR genes. So that means we can actually tell that if there are some cities in which we have been able to found, there are a lot of AMR genes found out within these microorganisms. We can tell that we, the people, the human beings are actually getting contact with these microorganisms, which are actually holding a lot of uh, antimicrobiotic resistance genes. And so this might be alarming information to us and we can, we can give good guidelines to people looking at these AMR genes and their associated profiles. Okay, so with that, I'm finishing my discussion about the contributions that we made in this particular area and listing up different softwares and algorithms you know uh, you need this bow tie too uh, for doing some sort of basic analysis you have this blast stem and then this kraken uni so i have been uh, able to put up the link of all these tools that are available online so i highly suggest if you're really interested to look at the entire analysis you read the paper you see everything that has done there a lot of things have been done it's not possible to talk about everything there uh, here in this in this discussion but then I have uh, slightly introduced this Kraken Unique, this Centrifuge, and some other tools, um, including this, you know, UMAP and other things. So UMAP is there available as a part of Python implementation in many packages, I believe. Okay, so with that, I'm finishing. Um, thank you. If you have any questions, you may ask. Them. Thank you, Professor Vettacharya. Participants, if you have any question, you may please unmute. Raise your hand or unmute and speak. I'm sure there will be a lot of questions. Yeah, please, Sonam Kumar, please unmute yourself and speak. Yeah, thank you, Professor, for a uh, wonderful talk. So uh, so the problem that you were discussing was uh, kind of uh, finding out, classifying the metagenomics on a global level. But uh, like, I, I really appreciate the approach that you have taken. But let's say like we have got a few patients suffering from you know various diseases which have a metagenomic um, predisposition, for example, Parkinson's and other neurological disorders. So at a smaller level, like you know, even here there are like lots of billions of uh, microbiome um, uh, composition, uh, you know, tax tax uh, that might be possible. So uh, like, is the can, can we use the same approach while studying this? Uh, for example, in the gut microbiome or in the uh, skin microbiome or appendix. So, like, how do we um, 
you know use the same kind of uh, approach here like how do i scale is is your approach scalable yeah conceptually speaking one thing should be clear to you that if you want to make an algorithm scalable it might happen that we are losing some sort of accuracy so in many cases it could be some sort of approximation it could happen that we are doing some sort of estimation and then in many cases some of these algorithms have been made scalable with with a loss of you know accuracy or maybe estimation but then there are some approaches which are really good they can work better even in a, at a scale for example umap you can take this particular example all the umap is doing some sort of you know manifold level uh, approximation but then still umap is actually going to give you good results even if you have this only single site microbiom data but then maybe for this kraken unique you might get a better result if you choose something as an alternative just because kraken unique might be doing some sort of approximation it might not be good for a small scale data so some of them are good for everything some of them are only good for you know doing analysis at a scale only at a large scale not as and not at a, sm a smaller scale great thank you so i mean uh, like if i take like multiple patients um, having different grades of the disease progression probably that can be uh, yeah, yeah, way yeah you can you can use all these things yeah okay thank you so much thank you uh, any other questions any other participant please you can you can unmute and speak also anybody else i have a small question i mean maybe a bit ambitious because i have not delved deeply into this is that so you can have a geographical localization of the of the genome uh, of the microbiome uh, by this kind of analysis it is an excellent yeah. analysis i am i am i as a i mean excited to look at this so, so when there are epidemics and other spreads can this be used to kind of signature or profile the path of the epidemic or uh, the origin of the epidemic yeah what people are actually doing in europe we are also a part of that which is known as meta cop project so this meta is actually a big consortium we are actually having multiple projects under that consortium meta sub is only for metagenomics at subways we are having a different kind of project project which is metagenomics for the cov cov means the coronaviruses where we are actually looking at you know uh you know you have this waste water although you cannot visualize it being at kolkata or maybe in west bengal or maybe in india in many cases we don't have a properly structured waste water outlet uh, in india but in many cases in europe and in in many western countries we have the uh, sewage system the a properly structured sewage system so it has been observed that if you just look at the micro i mean metagenomic profiles of the sewage system with a good accuracy you can actually tell that by when it might have a pandemic of this sars cov so in europe a study has been done where people have seen that samples collected from the sewage water is actually giving a clue that what is the density of this if this sars cov to virus in that particular uh, sewage uh, system i mean for that particular region of the sewage system and they are actually seeing that the local pandemic is happening within a day so this is a really interesting to have a wastewater surveillance system from which you can do a prediction of pandemic so obviously you know that the viruses have different kind of i mean patterns of being uh, transmitted from one to the other so maybe the same thing cannot be done with all the viruses or maybe all the bacteria but then yeah for 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 many cases the pandemic can be predicted for for civil systems mm -hmm. just an example even for airborne virus i think there is be amount of footprint which yeah, the happen. only the only problem is that you know i mean uh, before starting this kind of large scale global project we have to define a protocol firmly we have to be very yeah. sure this is the protocol now the problem is that for collecting air samples that is not a good protocol defined around the world like you know in air you don't have a material there na so i mean for sewage you will dip the dip the device into the water and then you will collect a sample i mean it's say you you at least need 3 to 5 ml of the water and you can collect the microorganisms mm. from there for metal you will just uh, that the swab that the swab that you are basically using to collect i don't know how many of you have done so rt pcr test the swab that is basically used you can basically rub that swab around the surface for 1 to 2 minutes that's enough and then you dip it into a solution i can tell you what are the microorganisms in that surface or better to say on that surface now the thing is that for air the protocol is something like you have to you know uh, uh, i mean you have to just uh, do something like this 
for a minute or so and then assume that okay yeah the microorganisms are getting connected with your with your swab but that's that's not a good good assumption we, we may okay. have a better so protocol in near future yeah we may have a better protocol in near future okay. where people will be collecting samples from air and may predict airborne diseases but for the timing for really? SARS-CoV-2 yeah for the timing for the SARS-CoV-2 although it is airborne disease people are being able to predict it from the sewage system yeah that's what we yeah that's great that's great uh, uh, very good i am uh, so we have another question from saurabh roy and sonam kumar so yeah. can you please unmute saurabh yes, good afternoon yeah good afternoon yeah uh, that this was a very informative presentation thank you very much sir and um, i have a, a very small question that is uh, do you uh, see this uh, the use of uh, the uh, the system as a uh, you know useful resource for surveillance uh, or something like that in your future uh, yes, like, yes, is there yes, any yes. work on that dimension that's what yes, i yes, yes 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 as a part of the metaco project we are also trying to develop a surveillance system based on the sewage system and that is being done in new york Currently, this is happening in New York. We cannot do it in India, although uh, we, I mean, although Kolkata, I mean, you might have heard that all, Kolkata has a wastewater uh, sewage, uh, I mean, sewage system, but that that is pretty old. That is made by the British people. Uh, it's not still that functional, and so I mean, it's it's hard to do these kind of things in India. But the things are being happening in in New York currently, and we are planning to extend it to Europe also. Yes, sir. thank you very much. And you know, the most interesting thing is the surveillance of the current pandemic. Just because we have now information about a lot of viruses and bacteria, we know that, that this bacteria or maybe these viruses are there, which is a new species. I mentioned we have more than 10,000 viruses discovered, around 500 bacteria discovered and so on. So we now have this, this study done for a particular period of three years and we are continuously doing that. Maybe if we see after 10 years, after doing some sort of longitudinal analysis, that a particular virus is increasingly, I mean, it is becoming quickly increasing. Let's say a couple of bacteria is quickly increasing in a particular region of a, of a city. We can, we can do some sort of surveillance based on that because we have the previous data with us. Yes, sir. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. yeah. So we have uh, one more question from Sonam. Sonam Kumar. Sonam Kumar, can you please uh, ask your question? Yeah, thank you uh, for um, answering my previous question. So uh, this question is nearly same as what Saurav uh, was asking. So uh, like, uh, I mean, the data that we're collecting, right? So the, the metagenomic composition, the microbial population, that might, that's, that's transient, that's transient, right? That's not like uh, co constant at all times. So uh, isn't that a bias uh, that, that, that you are creating while collecting the data? Or uh, are you collecting it once? Are you collecting it at regular intervals from different parts of the city? Uh, how is the data acquisition done? Okay, so you should understand that obviously it's a transit system and that is why there are a lot of people interacting with this mass transit system. And so obviously the microorganisms will also expect that we are changing. The way we expect that, we will be affected by the microorganisms. The microorganisms are also getting affected by the individuals who are moving around. So obviously they will be changing. So we have to actually define it in a way such that we are not just picking up a single city and a single metal and a single metro station to pick up the sample. Rather, we are taking multiple samples. That is why we are expecting that we are having a good estimation of the microorganisms residing there. We are doing it repeatedly for several years and then uh, you know, we are not taking random random metro stations like we are actually choosing a chain. For example, let's say I'm choosing a path like Dam Dam to, you know, Ravindra Sharovar that is there in Kolkata. And then in each station, we will be collecting the metagenomic samples. And then that will be done for each material, roughly six to seven materials we are targeting. And then that will be sequenced. And then this will keep on happening over the years. So. We can make a good estimation that, okay, even though there are changes, but then the accumulation of the things, we are actually looking at it not just as a single species, we are looking at the ecology. Remember that it's a microbiome, the entire ecology. Whether the entire ecology is getting affected or not, that is the main concern. There might be a change of the number of microorganisms, there might be a change of the distribution of the microorganisms, 
but then the entire ecology should not be changing and we are actually computing a score which is known as diversity you know alpha diversity beta diversity these are measures with which you can actually tell what is the diversity of the different microorganisms in that community so if it is slightly changing then the diversity values will be pretty close over the years or maybe over different cities so by looking at the diversity we can tell that yeah they are pretty close with each other even though we have individual samples and that might be changing that might be transit but the diversity tells that tells that it is a more robust measure to look at the different city profiles so we we have done that also is that clear so that even though it might be transit the diversity yeah, the diversity will not significantly change right so as far as i understand it you are looking at like particular position particular uh, site in the city and you're tracking the longitudinally how the microbiome is changing and that that's the representative data that you are collecting yeah great okay, and i can highlight so a very interesting observation although it's not a part of this kind of discussion because you know there might not be good i mean a lot of people from medical science but just because this is really interesting to listen we have seen that uh, let's let's say we which you choose a particular path let's say this is a metro chain route and then there is a hospital which is closer to a metro station we have seen that these amr genes the profiles of the amr genes that are found in the red metro station which is closer to a hospital is different than the other metro stations that are far from the hospital so the people who are coming out of the hospital are actually carrying different kind of unique signatures within them because they are holding some sort of microorganisms that are that are permanent resident of that hospital so we have actually published another paper last year in nature medicine where we have shown that if you keep on collecting the microorganisms from a particular hospital environment you will see that there are a lot of microorganisms that are actually regular habitant and that is an interesting concern although you understand it quite correct that it will it is changing but there are a lot of microorganisms which are actually permanent resident of a particular place a fraction is changing but maybe there is a larger fraction which is constant for that place and this happens for individual hospitals so if you go far from the hospital you will see that these amr gene profiles will keep on changing so this is interesting so just because in hospital the drugs are regularly getting administered the people who are there are getting affected with these drugs the microorganisms which are also residing there are also getting affected with these drugs so there are a lot of amr genes in existence closer to the hospitals and then you go far you don't have that so these are interesting observations maybe the concept of horizontal uh, gene transfer can be put into place here yeah, yeah. to explain it yeah great thank you so much professor yeah i can see there is another hand raised sr and yeah this. hold up Yes, uh, yes, sir. This is me again. Sir. I just is that the one... previous hand or the new hand? Yes, sir. The previous guy. Yes, sir. So, so just I have just one more question. That is, uh, do, uh, do these resources like uh, the uh, data and uh, you know the sequences which you have worked on is this available on public resources or is it uh, you know? Yeah, public, public. You you know that I have listed all these tools that are actually starting with this website link GitHub. most of these are available on github and the and the data that i have shared at the beginning is publicly available the meta meta sub data is publicly available in the link that i have mentioned there i can share the slides with the organizers who can share it with you at a later stage okay oh, thank you sir thank you so very much if it is required alternatively you can read the cell paper you will get everything from there any other question any participant okay then uh, let us thank speaker for the excellent talk i think it has inspired many of the young people young researchers young student to work in